Today, I'll be joined by Trevor Sikama from Pro Football Focus for the whole episode to talk about Gators prospects at 2021 season. Coach Billy Napier coming to Gainesville only here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Lockdown Gators, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by Sonos. Sonos is the official sponsor of ESPN College Football. Go to Sonos.com to learn more. Happy Tuesday. I am Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. I'm also the founder of Whole9Sports.com, where you can find all of my written work. And I'm about to be joined by Trevor Sikama right now. All right. And as you can see, I'm joined by Trevor Sikama once again. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey with Pro Football Focus now. A little bit of a little bit of a job change since last time we had you on here. How are you doing, Trevor? I'm doing great, Brandon. Always, uh, always great to chat some Gator football with you. So I appreciate you having me back on. Of course, glad you're here. And I'm, I'm just going to start off with obviously the biggest news in Gators football. How do you feel about the hiring of Billy Napier? I, you know what, I, I, I like it. It's, it's been a whirlwind for me as a Gator alumni, as I'm sure it has been for all Florida Gator fans this season because they have such an incredible year last year. They have one of the best offenses in the country. They rack up so many wins. They have all these stats and everything's going in the right direction for Mullen, right? Everything is right there. He's got the talent. This year, we knew that it would be a step down, right? You're losing Kyle Pitts. You're losing Kadarius Tony. You're losing Kyle Trask. You're losing so many of these guys that were just paramount to the success of what you had last year. And so you knew it was going to be a step down. But, you know, you had the struggles early on. He thought that it was it was Emory Jones's time to really shine, and he got out there. And Emory played well within structure, but I think very quickly you just kind of knew that Emory wasn't going to be a transcendent kind of a player this year. Like this, it was probably just going to be a learning year at best for Emory Jones, and that's what it really was. And all that got kind of clouded and muddy when Anthony Richardson took the field and was as electric as he was. So then all of a sudden, like, okay, do we have a quarterback competition? Do you play the younger guy? And there was back and forth and everything. And bringing all of this to the coaching aspect, I think Mullen really struggled with that because Mullen definitely always felt like a loyalty guy. And you look at Emory Jones, Emory Jones committed to the program. He stayed there through Mullen you know, Kyle, Kyle Trask was, was the guy they ended up picking Kyle Trask. And Kyle Trask plays all these years, plays all these games. Emery sits there, doesn't transfer. He stays, he stays, he stays. And I think that Mullen really above, above a lot of things that maybe it shouldn't be, probably to a fault, wanted to give this year to Emery Jones. Because basically as a thank you for not, not transferring, not moving on. And that proved to be a big problem. And I think that was a big part of when you really started to see Mullen get annoyed with questions, annoyed with media, and just not have a very friendly, I'll guess, persona that, that came out to him. And it really started to rub people the wrong way. And this has kind of always been Mullen's shtick. I don't really think this is anything new, but we talk about winning, curing everything, right? And when you're winning, I think that that works. I think when you're winning, people put up with it because you could be a little bit ab abrasive. You can you can give people a little bit of attitude, but at the end of the day, you're right because you're winning games. This year, they they weren't winning games the way that they were before. So all of a sudden, kind of this persona that Mullen had, it got really old really quick. And I was one of the people that in the middle of the year, I was like, Florida's not going to do better than Mullen, especially in this quarterback in, in this coaching cycle. Mullen's one of the best X's and O's coaches in college football. That is, is no different now than it was a couple of months ago. I think he's an incredible offensive mind. I really did not think that Florida was going to go out and get better than Mullen. But as time went on and as they continued to struggle, and when they got blown out by South Carolina and struggled against Missouri and, 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 and Samford and like the, these opponents, they had no business struggling against, let alone losing to. All of a sudden, it just becomes too much. And you throw in the, the recruiting comments that he's made and all that. And I think that that's just really what put it over the top to where even somebody like me who thought they weren't going to get better than Dan Mullen, even I admitted at the end of the year, down with a couple of games left, I'm like, he, he's got to go. Like, he's like I, I, 
I don't want to root for this dude anymore. I, I don't want to care about Florida football while this guy's in charge of it. And so all of that is a, a long prerequisite answer to your question of what do I like about Billy Napier? Do I like the hire? I do like it. And I know it's not the splash name. I know it's not like USC going out and getting Lincoln Riley, but I really do feel like Billy Napier is the right guy for this job, where this program is, where they need to go. Is Florida going to win a national championship in the next two, two, three years? No, probably not. But from this background of everything that I've kind of read up and, and really figured out with Billy Napier, he just seems like the right guy for the job. He really does. And, and it, it was a weird split with Mullen. But this is the guy I think that there were, that is the right choice all along. And I really am. I'm excited about Billy Napier being the head coach of Florida. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm with you or for the vast majority of Dan Mullen's time. I was like, Dan Mullen's the guy. Like he he's gonna get us there. He's gonna he's gonna be the guy. We're not gonna get better than him. And then I still think he's a fantastic coach, but I do I, too. It just it 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 didn't work out here. And it's it's one of those things where you can talk about, oh, like, how are we going to get better than Dan Mullen? Because even with this down year, he still has the third highest winning percentage among Florida coaches since 1924. He's only behind Spurrier and Meyer. And it's like, it, it's it's interesting to see. Because, I mean, now with Billy Napier, I'm, I'm all in. I'm very excited for him. And I'm, exci- I'm ecstatic that it's literally just came down to Scott Strickland went, meant to meet one guy. And he was like, yeah, I don't need to do anymore. And it just ended up being being Billy Napier, and that's that's awesome for us. Uh, do you have any? I realize I didn't ask you about this one beforehand. Do you have mm-hmm. any names that you'd want for OC or DC? I don't know who he's going to get his offense coordinator, right? Because obviously, like he's an offensive guy, so I'm not exactly sure who he's going to want there, how he's going to want to delegate. I will say that in in doing a lot of reading on Billy Napier over the last couple of days since it was kind of beneficial for him. What I really like about his background is that it's almost like a tale of two lives for him. He started out as a grad assistant, as every college hedge coach really does. He started out as a grad assistant, and he worked his way up, and he very quickly climbed the ladder to the point where I'm sure everybody listening knows this already, but he became the youngest offensive coordinator in the Power Five when he became Clemson's offensive coordinator under Davo Sweeney back in, what was this, 2010, 2009, something like that. He was 29 years old. He was 29, 30 years old when he became an offensive coordinator. And Dabo called him one of the finest young coaches in all of college football. He was a fantastic recruiter. Two years later, he got fired. Two years later, their offense was terrible. Like Billy Napier thought he was hot stuff. Like he thought he was the man. And two years after that, he gets fired. And Napier himself has done a lot of interviews where he's talked about how that really changed him, how he always up to that point in his life was a at the office at five or 6 AM leaving the office at midnight, burning the candlestick at both ends. Like he just it, it, like he, his, his work ethic consumed him. His career consumed him. He had nothing else. And he said, when he got fired, he had to take a massive step back. And the next job that he got after he got fired as offensive coordinator for Clemson is he became an offensive analyst under Nick Saban. Now offensive analyst, you're not a coach. You're not a hands-on guy. You're not coaching any, any, any players for a position. You're not calling plays. You're not an assistant offense coordinator. Like you are literally just there to be in the room and kind of digest ideas, give your own ideas and, and just kind of be part of the coaching staff and part of the team. That's a massive step back from where he was before. That's essentially what he was doing when he started as a grad assistant before. So now obviously he was just doing it under Saban. So that's a higher level there, but Over these next last 10 years that he has had up to this point, it's been a lot of realizing that you got to delegate, you got to hire, you got to, you got to do the work to hire smart people and let them do their thing. So I don't know what his offensive coordinator, all of that to say, I don't know what his offensive coordinator choices are going to be at UF because I know he's an offensive guy and I'm not sure that who he's got there for defensive coordinator. I've been I've been told he's going to swing high. You know, I've been told that he's like going after some big names. Patrick Tony's the big defensive coordinator that a lot of people really wanted him to bring over from Louisiana. And I think he still might, but like, I've also heard names like, um, like Knowles, the uh, I can't Knowles. first name, Jim Knowles. I don't know why I'm, do you, yep. do you know this? Is it Jim yep. Knowles? It's Jim Knowles, the Oklahoma Jim State. Knowles, Jim Knowles, the yeah. defensive coordinator for Oklahoma State. And Oklahoma State's like, the number three defense in the country this year, which is wild. And I know I get it. I get it guys. It's the big 12. So it's not like you're playing the best competition every week, but you know, he's, I've heard that he's been in the conversation. And so I, 
I don't have any names. I really don't know because that was also a big, I think, point of emphasis or something that I wanted to figure out with Billy Napier is, sure, head coaches are great, but you got to have coordinators. Like, you got to have people, especially at offensive and defensive coordinator, that you know that you could bring in, that buy into the program, that are up and coming, all those things. That's what makes a successful program, especially for a guy making the jump like Napier is. So, I don't know. I, I don't have a ton of names off of uh, off the top of my head um, because this college football year is is super weird, and I guess nobody is uncoachable now that we've seen the Lincoln Riley thing. So who knows? Who knows at this point? I'm not sure exactly who he's going to get, but uh, I like his background. I like how he approaches things. I like how he is already very into hiring the right people, coming up with a good process, delegating responsibilities. That's going to cultivate a healthy relationship, no matter who the coordinators end up being. Um, I mean, I'm just going to shamelessly self plug uh, Thursday, Friday, we're, we're going to talk about that on Locked On Gators. So. There you go. I got to listen then. I'm going to listen. <laughs> this is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Or like I said, in my case, my cat climbs in front of my TV when I'm playing PGA Tour to get 21. I don't know what to tell you. Is that how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash NCAA. Head to netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA for special end of year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That is netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA. All right, college football fanatics, have you heard about PrizePix? PrizePix is daily fantasy made easy. I love it, and I know you will too. PrizePix offers every sport you can think of. I'm talking NFL, college football, NBA, college basketball, MLB. NHL, soccer, MMA, and more. PrizePix offers more college football props than anyone in the world and offers all the star players of the Power Five, as well as players you may have never heard of. You know, Bryant Kobach, Bryce Mitchell. You don't know them yet, but you will when they're in the NFL making plays. They're at Toledo right now. PrizePix allows mixed sport entries. You can take the over on Colin Kelsey and blocks, which you should with the under on Damian Pierce carries, which you should if Dan Mullen was still the coach, but thank goodness he's gone in the same entry. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepix.com or go to your app store and download the app today. PrizePix is daily fantasy made easy. You know, another thing with Florida now is with the roster turnover that could be happening with draft and possible transfers. I wanted to talk a little bit about the draft because that's something that we've covered recently because, of course, the team has not been doing well, and uh, that that sucks, so we've got to look for some bright spots. But uh, how do you feel about this Gators draft class, You know, specifically looking at Kyrie Elam is, of course, the big name for us? Yeah, Kyrie Elam, he's going to be the name at the top, no doubt about it. Now, it's a pretty damn good cornerback class. Like, Derek Stingley's in it, Amon Garner's in it. Obviously, Kyrie Elam is right there, but... There's a lot of really good corners that are in this class. So I think the Kyrie is still going to be a first round pick. But, you know, we saw some people say that he was going to be a like a for sure top 10 pick because you look at him, you look at the frame, how he's a little bit taller. He's still athletic. He's still very flexible. And so anytime that, that you have that formula, that spells out a guy who has the potential to go top 15, top 10 overall. It's not this lock that he's going to go top 10, but I'm also not saying it's impossible either. I think that the combine process the interview process all those things are good it could really work into Kyrie Elam's favor if he performs better than a lot of these guys next to him but I'm just saying the competition is pretty stiff it's pretty stiff for him so it's not like it's this guarantee he's one of the only good corners that's there um I like the year that Zachary Carter's been having you know it's obviously been a, a blooming year for him and what's kind of been a slow burning career but I think that he's Played really, really well this season. He certainly put his best foot forward. I still think that Bretton Cox Jr. is probably the more premier edge rusher that you're going to get from this Gators defensive line. Uh, he's been the guy who's been able to give you a lot of flash. I just don't think there's been a ton of defensive production in general over the last couple of years, and so that's made it kind of difficult. But I would still probably tell you that Brenton Cox Jr. is is that next guy that's there. Those are really the three biggest players, I think, in this draft class. If we want to flip over to the offensive side of the ball, Damian Pierce, he grades super high for us at PFF. He's got an elite grade, I think. I think it's, what is it? Uh, I got it right here in front of me. 
it's like a 92.3 or something. Like his his grade is just really, really high, and he's been having a fantastic year. And I know people have been crying for uh, him to get the ball more, and with good reason, as we kind of saw this past weekend when he was playing against Florida State. But I, w- I would tell you that I, th- I think those are I think those are the big four. Unless I'm like su- forgetting somebody out of nowhere, which if I am, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, those are those are the four that when I think of this Gators draft class, those are probably the most notable names that you've got right now. Yeah, and I mean th- this has pretty much been locked on Damian Pierce all season over here. I've just been it should be, it should be. pounding the table for him, and like I- I've brought up with PFF, you know, um, up until recently, Florida had as a team the best running grade in college football. You know, they fall into Texas now, and I believe there's another team now ahead of them. They're third, I think, or at least before the Florida State game. That was, but based off my memory, that's where they were. Um, And the run blocking grade has been pretty damn bad. So it's like, like, you have to look at the ball carriers here are really making a ton of plays when you look at just that run grade being so high, because again, they were for the majority of the season, the number one running team, according to PFF, but the run blocking grade was not high. So it's like you look at guys like Damian Pierce, who at one point had like, I think it was 70% of his yards were after contact. Like he, he, like he was creating for himself and just not getting the ball, which is incredibly yep. frustrating. Yep. Uh, and I get that the run grade was maybe bumped up a little bit because of guys like Anthony Richardson hurtling dudes out there and just getting these massive runs. But I mean, this has been a team that just, I had uh, a guest last week, Ian Cummings on, and he was like, this is a team where there's so many guys where it's like, there are solid draft prospects. Like Ian Cummings likes Justin Shorter a lot. Mm-hmm. And Jacob Copeland's another name. And it's like, but there's just been so many like coaching questions as to whether they've been able to be developed properly or whether they've been put in the proper position to succeed. Uh, right. One guy that I really like that I would like your opinion on if you have one is safety Trey Dean. Cause he's someone who, I, I mean, Earlier in the season, I mean, he was not great. At least I was critical of him. And then he really cleaned up. And, I mean, still, yeah, I mean, he's someone that I like. Yeah, safety stuff is always, I mean, it's always kind of a combination of two things, right? Athleticism and recognition and anticipation. Those are the two things. I think that Dean is athletic enough, and I think that he has always been. But that that recognition and anticipation part of his game, it's just taken a while to come to kind of come on. And I agree with you. I feel like he's been playing better ball as of late. He still struggled early in the season. I felt like he was I felt like he was still too boomer bust to be a highly draft highly drafted prospect at the beginning of the season. Might be a little bit different now. The safety class isn't super deep this year. So that might really help him out and you know I think there's some versatility that he might be able to have as obviously a box defender and a nickel defender and things like that. I feel like he he might be able to give a team that kind of versatile defensive back play but I just I, I I I've never doubted the athleticism part of Trey Dean because that's always what's pop. That's what got him on the field early. That's what you love to see there. But he has needed to be better at that anticipation and recognition. And I haven't gone back and done a full study of him this year. I think that he's been more reliable as of late. I would agree with you, but you might have put him under the microscope a little bit better than me. That's just my assessment of him when he was going into this year as we were building out the preseason big board and, and guys to look out for trading was obviously somebody who was on my list because I've watched him a ton because I've watched every Gators game, but safety play is one of those things where you really got to pop on all 22 and you've got to be able to see what guys are doing, how they're moving within coverage, whether the ball is coming to them or not. And so Dean just seemed, I don't want to say hesitant, hesitant's probably the wrong word, just not as confident as he could have been with anticipation and breaking on the ball. And when, when he has, like when it's all lined up for him, obviously we'll see big hits, we'll see turnovers, we'll see takeaways, pass broken up, things like that. It just wasn't as consistent as you wanted. And safety, that word, that position, that word means that you're the last line of defense. You've got to be positive that you are right in what you're doing, whether it's in a single high roll or whether you're coming up or whether you're robbing over the middle or whatever it is. And so, um, Maybe it's more reps thing. Maybe it's maybe it's a trading might be a early day three kind of a guy in this upcoming draft class and you get him on a practice squad, you get him on a, a, a preseason squad and just more reps and things like that that he could really develop into that year two and year three of a rookie deal in the NFL. That's kind of my take on him right now, but uh, all subject to change over the last co- the next couple of months as I get a lot more tape on her. Where you at? You listen to podcasts for the power of the inside track. You switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money. Because with Boost, you get the power of a free 
5G phone so you can listen to the latest episodes of Locked On Gators and keep up with your favorite players and teams, all Florida Gators, of course. The power of three unlimited data lines for 30 bucks a month per line so your family can share all the insights and the power of one of America's largest 5G networks so you can do it all at the speed of 5G. With all that money you'll save and all that edge you'll gain, just how powerful will you become? Switch to Boost Mobile and find out. Get a free Samsung Galaxy A32 5G when you switch to one of America's largest 5G networks. More power to save, Boost Mobile. Disclaimer, free phone limited to new customers and one per line. Additional restrictions apply. Offers and coverages not available everywhere or for all phones and networks. See BoostMobile.com for details. Anybody else make money this past weekend? I know I didn't. I bet online took so much of my money on Sunday. It was ugly. It was pretty. I mean, I, I made it back on Monday, but my word was Sunday bad. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action. Obviously, Florida's made it a rough year for me, but yeah, you know, we move. It's simple as that. Bet online even covers award shows, TV shows, and reality TV. With real-time updated odds and props on almost <clears throat> anything you can imagine, it is the best way to place your bets, and it's 100% free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your online sports for experts. Make sure to use promo code locked on. That is L O C K E D, no space O N. Yeah, and then you know you mentioned Brenton Cox Jr. as one of your defensive guys to focus on, or at least to pay attention to. Uh, what do you think an NFL team is going to? Of course, as much of an opinion as you can give on this. Uh, how do you think an NFL team is going to feel about someone who's been relatively boom or bust? You know, he had four sacks against Florida State, but he also had a few offsides penalties and unsportsmanlike and all all these things where he, like I said, Brenton Cox Jr. giveth and he taketh away because there's been times where he just stops pursuing quarterbacks running. Right. I don't know. It kind of kind of depends on the year, right? I, we, uh, Todd Grantham, defense coordinator if, at, at Florida, well, former defense coordinator at Florida. I don't know how much these guys like playing for Grantham. I, I don't know how much they were super bought in. I don't know how much Brenton Cox really believed in the guys around him because there are times, yeah, no doubt about it, like early couple of games in the season, you watch it and it just feels like he's playing at a different speed. He's playing at a different level and it, it really shows up. But he has been a lot more inconsistent, or I'll just say he's been more quiet than I thought that he was going to be, not just this year, but last year too. I thought that he was going to have a much bigger year. There were flashes where I'd say, this dude could show up every week, he could be a game wrecker, and that's just not what he was. And I don't know how much the environment goes into this. You know, his size is about 6'3", 6'4". He's right around 250, 255 pounds. So he's kind of that off-ball linebacker type. He might be able to be a stand-up guy in it in a three, four, or, you know, you might be able to get versatile with him with his hand in the dirt, depending on what kind of defense you're running at the next level. So like Dean, I think that he presents you a multitude of, of positions that he can play as a pass rusher. So that certainly helps his, that, that certainly helps his draft stock when you're able to do something like that. You get more coaches to maybe believe in the flashes, believe in the highlights, because that is sometimes what we're told in scouting, right? Tell me what a guy can do. That's it. That's a phrase that a lot of people talk about in scouting. And so even though you can't, guys can't be liabilities, right? You can't totally throw away the negatives. If you see the positives and if you're drafting a guy uh, right around fringe top 100, whatever it ends up being third round, fourth round, something like that, those are players that you can take a chance on their traits. And I think that Bretton Cox Junior really has great traits. I think he's got good get off on the ball. I think he's got some good moves when he's really aggressive with him. Obviously, he's got a knack for bending around the edge, getting to the outside, attacking outside shoulders of offensive tackles. And so all of that, I think, presents itself as a guy that you would bet on. I would have loved to see him be a little bit more consistent, a little bit more dominant, work himself into more of that top 50 range, maybe fringe first round range, because I used to see him uh, at the end of some first round mocks. I certainly don't see him there anymore, but He's a player who you're going to have to watch the good and the bad. You're going to have to see what you need to shore up. But he's also a player that when he gets interviewed by media members for the draft cycle, he might not be as honest as he needs to be. But when NFL teams really sit him down and they go, okay, like what happened at Florida the last two years? He might be able to, he might be able to say like, okay, well, like 
I was a, a man alone over here. Like there was nothing going on. There. I, I, and this is all speculation. I have no idea because I am with you. For as good as Brenton Cox Jr. has looked at times, you'd think we'd seen it. We would have seen it a little bit more. We just haven't. So who knows? Not exactly sure what the answer to that is, but I do know the NFL is going to like his pass rush traits a lot because the NFL is always looking for big time pass rushers. And then there's just one more guy I wanted to touch on quickly. Um, tight end Kimori Gamble. He's kind of turned it on as of late. And I know I like him, but could be a smidge bias here. Uh, how do you feel about him and his potential pro prospects? No, I think he's played great, right? His career year and everything. It's career in, in, in the total yards and the touchdowns and the, in the yards per 10. So like the usage has been up all across the board. They've given him more responsibility and he's been able to deliver for him. So he's, a big body receiver kind of tight end, you know, it's, it, I, I don't think that he's, you've got some of these guys like, like the Harrison Bryant's that are coming in at like sub 240 and things like that, where you go, okay, I can't even play you tight end. Like there's, there's not even the allurement that you're putting your hand in the dirt, but we're seeing so many, we're seeing so many tight ends come in and be able to play much more of these like big slot roles where you don't have to be a dual threat if you're not. And, uh, you know, I think that, Gamble kind of gives you this late round flyer ability to have a guy that could be a tight end two or a tight end three on your roster that can help you out when you get super heavy in your personnel and can help out in certain situations. And I think he's a guy that some teams definitely get to take a flyer on. No matter what team you are in the NFL, tight end usage is at a premium right now. There's all sorts of flexibility on whether you're playing two tight ends on the line of scrimmage, two guys next to each other, split across the formation. You got one attached to the line of scrimmage. You got one in the slot on the other side. Like, whatever it is, tight end is huge. And, you know, a lot of people say, hey, you can't just have two great wide receivers anymore. You got to have a wide receiver three, a wide receiver four that can really contribute that's how I feel about tight ends. You can't just have a top tight end anymore. Like you've got to have not only a top tight end that you go to in all situations, you might have to have a blocking specialist. You might not have to have a receiving specialist and you got to have like four tight ends that you might be able to go to. And so I'll say that uh, Gamble has picked a great age to be alive and play the tight end position because I think it's really helping him a lot. His stats aren't going to jump out at you. They're not something that especially coming off of a year where Kyle Pitts was as dominant as he was. It's not like you're looking back at the Florida program and seeing another Kyle Pitts type of player, but Gamble's played really well. They at Florida Mullen developed a tight end kind of flexible, heavy offense with Kyle Pitts there. And I think that Gamble was able to step into some of those plays and really make some money for himself. So, you know, before going into this year, I'd have told you the gamble's not really on anybody's radar. Now, might be a late round guy that you take a chance on, you put him in a practice squad, you get him in the depth, and you get him in a program, you got him around a couple of years. And so I think that, that this year has been great for him. It really has. Not sure where it ends up with him getting drafted, but I think it's been really good for him. All right. Thanks, Trevor. And thank you again for coming on. And we'll get you on again before the draft for sure. You can find Trevor on Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey. Find all his work with Pro Football Focus. And yeah, thanks. We'll have you again. Appreciate it, Brandon. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't miss out tomorrow where we'll talk about how Billy Napier should be attacking recruiting and the transfer portal this cycle. And we'll review both of the Florida Gators basketball games tomorrow. Now make your second listen Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. For Locked On Gators, I am Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. You can find all my written work with whole9sports.com, and I will see you all tomorrow.